Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Preeti Patnaik. I'm the founding editor of Geneva Health Files, um, an investigative newsletter on global health. Uh, welcome to this event on um, licensing and access to health technologies, um, organized by uh, Salud Pujerecho, the Right to Health Foundation, and Health Action International. Uh, today, the authors of the report um, will present their findings, and we'll also learn from them um, the wider context unfolding around us, particularly with respect to intellectual property and technology transfer. Um, there's a fair amount of uh, granularity in this report, and I welcome our uh, uh, audience to, to refer and read the report. Before I get to the introduction uh, to the panelists, I just wanted to set the ball rolling in terms of the um, you know, context around us, as, uh, especially as far as tech transfer is concerned. Um, it has been, of course, discussed uh, almost in a near ubiquitous manner um, across uh, the WTO uh, in the TRIPS waiver discussions, in the ongoing discussions on the pandemic accord, um, and also uh, within the EU uh, in the context of the uh, Health Emergency Preparedness and Response Authority. Um, and we must also recall the uh, long uh, held promise of the TRIPS agreement uh, that, of course, protects uh, intellectual property, but also um, promises uh, technology um, transfer and, and dissemination of uh, technology. But this, uh, this hasn't happened because the incentives um, you know, favor patent owners. Okay, and not okay. uh, so, no, so in this event, we'll really hear about the obstacles and opportunities um, in technology transfer. Um, we, we, the, we have the following plan for today. The authors will present a report. We'll also um, uh, listen to HAI on licensing and, C, uh, and issues around CTAP. And we have an expert joining us from uh, Geneva's Graduate Institute. And we also have a speaker from People's uh, Vaccine Alliance. Um, it is my uh, pleasure to uh, introduce the panelists today. Uh, we have uh, Irene Bernal, who's an access to medicines advocate um, and she's a research manager at uh, Salud Puderecho. She spent over 15 years uh, working on development policy and social policy reforms in UN and um, Europe, other European organizations. We have Jaime Manzano, uh, who uh, is a research officer at Salud Puderecho, and he has experience in medical data analysis and has worked at MSF. Uh, we have uh, Jaume Vidal, who uh, leads HAI's advocacy and campaign work on access to medicines and has worked on uh, pricing, transparency, uh, access to technologies, and, and human rights. We have uh, Adrian Alonso Ruiz, who's a researcher um, at uh, the Geneva Graduate Institute at the Global Health Center, and his research concerns the new business models for governing innovation and the global access to medicines. We have Maza Seyo, um, who is the Global South convener um, at the People's Vaccine Alliance, and in this role, she supports and links CSO organizations across continents. Um, so we now head straight to our first uh, presentation um, by the authors, uh, by um, uh, Jaime and Irene. Uh, just two housekeeping issues. One is that you have interpretation available um, uh, from, uh, uh, from Sp sorry, Spanish to English. And uh, I also welcome uh, our audience to put in their questions uh, in the Q&A. We try to uh, get to that uh, after our uh, session on the Q&A, um, or else we'll certainly try and get uh, responses uh, to your questions from the authors. Uh, over to Jaime. Thanks a lot, uh, Priti. Thanks everyone for being uh, here today. Uh, I will share now the uh, slides. Just as a matter of introduction, I will be speaking on the general context and the methodology of our research. And then my colleague Irina will continue with the results and recommendation. We'll be doing this first part in English, but the Q&A will be in Spanish, all our answers. So. Uh, as a reminder, as Priti said, please use the interpreter option. Um, I guess everyone is seeing now the, the correct um, uh, screen. If not, please uh, let me know. Um, first of all, uh, what we need to understand about this uh, context is that uh, PROs or uh, publicly funded and supported research organizations are uh, key players 
in the biomedical research ecosystem and are usually at the origin of um, important health technologies. Uh, frequently, uh, the result of, um, of this uh, publicly funded research is transferred to the private sector and therefore the capacity to control uh, critical issues such as uh, price setting um, or management of intellectual property is therefore lost. So what appears to be uh, critical is the governance of medical knowledge aimed at protecting and fulfilling public interest taking into consideration always what's the public return and public risk, risk taken. Uh, uh, then uh, what it's uh, um, the strategies that are designed by public research institutions with regards to the management of this biomedical IP is considered and is known to have an impact on the downstream access and dimension of health technology. And there are a number of strategies that can be used by PROs to enhance this access, such as non-exclusive licensing or inclusion of conditionalities as uh, safeguards of accessibility. Well, we know that uh, during um, COVID-19, uh, we have seen uh, a dimension of global asset access inequity of health technologies. And in order to alleviate these inequities, several initiatives to improve access conditions uh, were, were launched. And in that sense, uh, we had the Solidarity Call to Action, which set the basis for CTAP, the COVID-19 Technology Access Pool, uh, which encouraged uh, access to include access related causes in in the agreement especially through global non-exclusive voluntary licensing this type of initiative has been uh, replicated by other governments or donors we have seen it in the uh, in the um, um, in the European Commission temporary framework for uh, funding COVID-19 related uh, R&D. We have seen it also in the CEPIS uh, request for funding recipient vaccine developers to grant equitable access and ensure technology transfer processes in an effective way. And we have seen also that in the academia context. Uh, which, for instance, uh, we have as an example the COVID-19 technology access framework or the COVID-19 licensing uh, guidelines by the associations of university technology managers. However, we had a lot of initiatives, but what impact these initiatives had and what barriers at the end. So uh, at the beginning, we saw that... Uh, initial... Highly sorry to interrupt. I think um, the slides are not changing. We got a message from the listeners here. Oh, I'm sorry. Please let me know if you see now. Uh, uh, yes. Yes. Yeah. And now? It is a matter of sharing the screen now that is all. You should be seeing it now, full screen. And Yes, we do. Yeah. OK, sorry about that. It was a problem of sharing different screens. So I was uh, speaking on the context that we have seen all this initial support of diverse institutions and stakeholders, including uh, public research organizations for all these uh, pandemic related in, uh, initiatives. But at the end, what we have seen is that there was a lot of issues uh, in the implementation and fulfillment of public commitments, as we have seen the CTAP initiative, for instance, uh, in which only two public research organizations from two countries of the 43 that had officially endorsed the initiative concluding license agreement with CTAP. In that extent, uh, we, uh, we thought it was worth asking what barriers public research organizations fans face what's, when attempting to engage in technology transfer to multiple stakeholders through non-exclusive licensing or contributing to pools of patents and other data sharing mechanisms. When doing the review of the literature to investigate what the determinants of licensing strategy was, we saw that there were a number of strategies that um, institutions could, uh, could select from uh, with various degrees of exclusivity and that, that there were a number of factors that, that, that could influence that strategy picking. For instance, we saw that the nature of the invention, the um, type of licensee, as well as uh, 
capacity of transfer units, communication, negotiation process, a number of things that you can find in the report could influence the licensing strategy. But for the uh, biomedical innovation ecosystem, uh, there it's, it is very patent that uh, the sector that the public research organizations must navigate is an environment where exclusivity is the norm. Uh, in that sense, we uh, we tried to answer the question that you see in the screen, which is what are the barriers that PROs face when attempting technology transfer to multiple stakeholders and their non-exclusive licensing and relying on pool of patents and or products as well as data sharing mechanisms. So this is a brief note on me the methodology. As you can see on the right of the screen, there were three main inclusion criteria considered for the selection of the research centers. Uh, there was the geographical scope covering, covering Latin America, Europe, Africa, and Asia. There was a percentage, the percentage of public and of philanthropic funding, as well as the involvement in the basic or applied COVID-19 research uh, related research. Um, after an initial uh, mapping of the um, um, institutions and potential experts that could assist us in responding to this answer. Uh, we uh, did um, seven uh, semi-structure interviews with uh, five institutions and two expert experts that were recruited based on their knowledge on an expertise of the biomedical technology transfer ecosystem. Uh, one limitation to mention of our uh, methodology is that the sample size, this is a pilot study, but the sample size uh, had an influence on the external validity uh, and also that the acceptance rate that we had from the research institutions stood at 20%. So that's something to have in mind and that should work, uh, should be uh, work upon in the in the future. And now my colleague Irini will present the uh, results of our research. Um, thank you, thank you very much, Priti Jauma, and uh, the rest of colleagues and panelists. And uh, thank you very much to the to the audience that actually decided to to join this event. Um, well, I'm just just going to 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 go on um, not not really very much deep into uh, whatever is uh, um, all all the things that actually uh, the results that we gathered and the and and uh, the results collected because I mean we really don't have that time. You have the report, so you can take a look on it. And and Kaime and myself. We'll be more than happy to answer any questions via email uh, either today or or later on, but but really what we wanted to do today was basically to highlight the main results that uh, we found out after asking these people this 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 technology transfer people actually they many of them working at the technical level, some of them working at political and also technical level, how to deal with this in, in a daily basis. Because we've been, for, from our experiences, we've been very much referred to uh, um, technical um, and, and, uh, and, and transfer, tech transfer offices to find many of these responses to the questions that we have. If there is, uh, we have this assumption that uh, that there is definitely an. Oops, sorry, my camera was off. That we have this this assumption to definitely that there we do have this 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 problem to share I, to share uh, the knowledge to share the technology of health um, technologies, uh, um, but but what is behind the scene? What what is not functioning? What is the obstacles actually that? That, uh, that 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 actually make this this blockage to 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 go further on it. So basically, um, in terms of um, of the questions to the, all the participants, we request the first of all, what are licensing strategies that you most of the time deal with it? And basically, the responses when in that sense were pretty much. Uh, um, um, a pattern saying that decisions are basically made in a product by product basis. And this is this, this it has directly related with maturity of the product and also the uncertainty of whether this is going to be a product that is going, is going to be able to be taken to the end 
or whether it's going to be a failure. So these are the this 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 is these are two elements that are very much related with this product by product basis. In addition, in most of the cases, uh, exclusivity seems as at, at the best way to complete and scale up a product. Um, I would say it could be maybe the 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 the, the existing way, and uh, this is this is this is uh, this this business as usual, uh, following that path, and maybe not 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 referring or to looking for whether this is the best for the product or this is the best for the for the company who is getting the the technology. So this is this is this, this was something something very very interesting that we found out. But of course, that there are also uh, exceptions, and 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 it was very much often referred to that uh, the, the the licensing process from the very beginning, from the moment that you get the grant, is a quite a long and lengthy process, and many people actually and institutions can get involved into the into this process, and some of many of them they have different interests. So this is this 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 is something also also to look at it since there are different partners and there are also different attitudes. So this is this is something that it it's it's actually is is becoming part of the of, of the process as well. And then licensing strategies also depends on the funders conditions this is this is the first things that they always say this is the, the first thing that we look at it and whatever is written in the grant is something that we must follow so this 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 it has the this double this 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 this, this double result is this, this this is good that they follow actually this uh this this procedure because and, and to take a look on it on it uh as, as one of the first things that that you do when you get the when 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 you get the grant because if the funders actually change the conditions it definitely has an impact on it so and then defining this is as as some of the um, lines y luego claro algunas de las estrategias de uh, fin de licencia and the results there are also these barriers and obstacles that that, uh, that we kept uh, putting questions to the respondent is why non-exclusivity then it doesn't happen? Why this it doesn't come? Then among many of the responses, some of them were because, uh, I mean, we need, uh, we need the support from the team. And when we mean the team, we, we mean the researchers, we need the, pro and the, the research institutions, the tech transfer offices, of course. So it needs to be a dialogue. So, so, so the, from the very beginning, the strategy is the non-exclusive. Then sometimes it happens that non-exclusivity is because the partner does not require an exclusive license. So this is, this is an open window for, 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 for wider licensing. And then in addition, it can happen because product has many applications. So, so, so this can be an, an uh, this, this, this can be an, an, another element, or maybe because of course the funder, uh, it's also included in their conditions that it has to be licensed in a non-exclusivity basis. So this is another, another element, another important element. Uh, another obstacle or another barrier, as we want to call it, is that perception is that an exclusive license is easier to manage than a non-exclusive license. So this is this is a, a quite wide extended uh, assumption, and uh, and 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 maybe later on we can discuss it. But but it would be it's it's it, I think it's a, it's it's a great challenge to try to change this this mindset. So, um, so yeah, that, that, that would be the second one. And then the third one, I think that the knowledge and uh, the and tech transfer offices environment is usually perceived as a very technical, which indeed it is very technical, but they really have a lot to say and they can play a very significant role at institutional level because uh, they really have the key uh, knowledge and uh, and can have that dialogue inside and internally to impact the uh, the research centers and try to to shift the the policies. So, yeah. Next slide, please. 
And then, um, and the, yeah, there we go. And then second, this uh, regarding market market dynamics, which is, it's um, it's a quite often responses that uh, that we get when 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 you check when you talk with uh, tech transfer offices, is that um, most uh, TTOs they uh, they are in, they they are embedded into this business model which is adopted by pharmaceutical but it's also adopted by the research centers so they it, it's it's also the perception that uh, that the better you can deal with the business market the better the agreements and also better companies can can you you can do the outreach so this is really uh, this 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 was something that is is was it was quite often into the responses, and then in addition we can we 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 cannot forget that uh, TTOs they are both they are results oriented and they are also market oriented, which is definitely a, which is 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 definitely one of the drivers of it. It's it's the same like in the case of 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 the patents and researchers. So it's very much interlinked. Then, in addition, to, uh, when it comes to license multiple parties, the fact is that uh, it's it needs to have clear strategies. It's always referred to that it needs to have clear path and and where are we going to go with this? Because sometimes what happens is that who is getting the product? The first one who is coming and claiming for the product, or actually the best company which can have the product. So you really need to know the ecosystem and the environment. And sometimes what is the perception is that we need more resources. We need more people working on this. And, uh, and, uh, and there we go. So, uh, but in, in addition, what is also perceived is that uh, this sense of semi-exclusive license is more feasible to, to carry on. So yeah, next slide, please. Then regarding this uh, market dynamics and how public interest can be incorporated to public uh, uh, to, to this market dynamic, we had a quite a quite a strong set of questions regarding this this this, this concept, and um, and and in every case, public interest is recognized as an objective to be achieved. So this is this is a very important uh, and quite good starting point. In addition, access provisions is it's, it's also perceived as a field that needs to be further developed. The question is how, and the question is to define what is the perimeter, let's say, or what are the limitations, but there is definitely the perception that uh, that access provisions is, is an issue that, they, that it, has to, it has to have an open dialogue. Then, in addition, as well, the role of funding uh, um, uh, providers and funders, and uh, and it's 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 really crucial, and um, and conditions actually actu actually to favor uh, accessibility, and uh, and uh, it's it's they they always the suggestion was was the be the, the most we get into the ground conditions, the the, the farther we can go, so it's going to be easy for us to to go over negotiations. So, um, and so, uh, in, and, and lastly, I think that, uh, that COVID-19 actually put on the table what everybody knew that, that, uh, that, 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 that the business was functioning, but at the same time, everybody saw that there was a huge window of opportunity to change the way of doing, of doing licensing. Everybody knew the, uh, how inequalities and on access to vaccines, therapeutics, and diagnostics, and uh, so the perception is that uh, there is a window that can change, can change not only regarding the pandemic situations, but can definitely be a change that actually can apply to many other diseases. So this is this is also uh, these are also good news. Next slide, please. I think my, my, last, my last one. So uh, uh, some of our recommendations would be to take a look deep into license, current licensing policies 
but uh, to take it to the political level, but taking into account also technical people that can really, you can really have an open dialogue and, uh, and, uh, and, and to build up upon their experience because um, our sense is that there is really the vision that, uh, that certain things can be done and there is margin for, for, for maneuver, would say. Then uh, the fact is that public interest and social impact must be included into market dynamics. It will bring the need of indicators and process and, and, and to define the concept, but uh, there is a scope and there is the willingness to, to work in that direction from our perspective. Considered as a political issue, as I as I mentioned, then the great role of funders that uh, that uh, that it is also perceived by the by the research centers that they really have a, have a word to say in this, and then also to create incentives and initiatives that can definitely uh, um, find the way for a much more. Uh, wider licensing processes and we saw it with the pooling and the COVID and CTAP and with and other mechanisms and you can use other incentives like like other funding or specific funding or whatever that actually can uh, can can be an incentive for for research centers to move in that direction so I'm gonna leave it there but I'm just going to uh just uh, just just three Two final remarks that that are not in the report, but we think is really important is that these obstacles that we have identified, um, or barriers, whatever you want to call it, I think that uh, they they can be used to 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 find this counter narrative actually that uh, that to 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 change the way I've been been doing during the last during the last years and to start doing things differently. I think that we can find allies there and we can find people that they are very much willing to, to change certain aspects of the licensing process. So, so, so let's use this in our, in our benefit. And then uh, we are now looking to a pandemic treaty, which actually it has this tech transfer provision. So let's think on, 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 on the narrative, try to change it and to build upon and to open this dialogue and to start from now to work with them, because I'm sure that in the future we can we can definitely get some benefits. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, um, uh, Irene and uh, and Jaime. Uh, we just go over to uh, uh, Rami Vidal who will talk to us about licensing and the COVID-19 technology access pool at WHO. Roman. Thank you, Brite. Thank you, Irene and Jaime. I'm going to share like a couple of slides of how it works. For those who want to use it, there is an opportunity to uh, listen to the simultaneous Spanish interpretation. There's a little uh, globe icon and it says interpretation and you can choose the language. Oops. Yes, it works. Okay, that's good. Okay, so... I think that it's really interesting the report that Irene and Jaime just shared with, with us because it really tells us plenty of things that we knew, but there's also like new aspects that we have realized with the COVID-19 pandemic. I think that it is like a sort of landscape that is changing where you have like all features that are being replaced by new behaviors in the sense that it's very interesting to see like the practices that technology transfer offices in let's say universities or public research organizations have been conducting for the last say 10 15 years and how these practices are now under a much closer examination we see that for the first time now there are serious discussion of policies really focused on transfer of technology. And we are talking about policies that are going to be implemented. We are not talking about like really long-term goals of like, yes, let's achieve like, I don't know, it's like a 
<laughs> I don't know, some kind of really far away but laudable goal. I mean, we are talking about strategic targets like the governments are saying, and then people are asking for it at the at the national or regional levels. And I think that there's like this new reality that came with the realization with the COVID-19 pandemic of the consequences of like exclusivity based regimes. Like what happens when you have like a life-saving health good and its access depends on price or on availability linked to IP issues. Because the obstacles that we are seeing today to equitable access are not entirely new. I mean, there has been a constraint like by like the misuse and abuse of intellectual property and also like the lack of really technology transfer because the issue when I'm referring that now we are talking about really like getting engaged in policies for transfer of technology. It's because like what was, for example, in the TRIPS agreement, like say, yeah, like the goal of the TRIPS agreement, like in the mid-term future, it's like transfer of technology. In the sense, like we were asking, like developing countries, like enforce IP rights and the technology will come to you. Well, they enforced IP rights and they were still like out of like technology to manufacture vaccines, for instance. So I think that we are now in a new moment with new opportunities, new opportunities for collaboration and opportunities also to change like the schemas with, with which we used to work. And I think that Irene was clear in the sense that you can feel that there is like a new, I'm not going to say like willingness, but at least an openness by some universities, by some technology transfer units and people involved in this process to really listen to the possibilities of like inserting access clauses or really getting involved in the much more complex uh, world of non-exclusive licensing. And I think that here there's something that it's super important. It's like synergies. The issue here is like we have to work together with public research institutions, advocates, like public manufacturing cap capacities. In the sense, it's important to look at the things that we can do together, not at the things that we are doing by ourselves. In the sense, we live in a like market dominated or market shaped biomedical research model. But that's not permanent, that can be changed. And the structures are there. In the sense, we're not talking only about like the universities and the medical centers that we can have in Western Europe. We have like something like the mRNA uh, tech transfer hub based in South Africa. That's something completely new and full of potential. So we have really to surround these new structures with frameworks of collaboration. And we have the models to do so in the sense that, for example, this like tech transfer hub has been able already to replicate a vaccine. And we have the COVID-19 technologies access pool, which was like, it's one of the very few like specific or real consequences of one of, one of many declarations at the height of the pandemic, the so-called solidarity, the call to action and solidarity that was originated by Costa Rica. So it's really interesting to see how this like political statement was to result in something tangible. Okay, it's true that they have only licensed like one product and two institutions have engaged with the with CDAP so far. But the issue is really like the potential in the sense like when you have something that is groundbreaking, don't expect, don't expect it to go too far, too fast. So right now, I think it's, it's, it's really like they are at a crunching point. I think it's very interesting to see like the report that was published by Bemos, like with the support of the People's Vaccine Alliance like last week on CDAP. I think it's, it's a really a candid assessment of CDAP where it goes and where it can go. And I would like encourage if someone has the link to share it in the chat. But I think that what it's really important here, I'm trying to put my next slide.
it's like the way the way forward. And I think that there are like three issues which are really important that to to bear in mind. First, what we were saying, like constituencies. I mean, it's not. I mean, I know that you have been talking about not working in silos for twenty years, but I think it's important to start realizing that we need to engage with our colleagues in the scientific uh, areas. We have to work with grassroots organizations. We need to engage with local and national uh, public officials. And I think it's important also to, to talk and work with industry. I think that we cannot afford to be confrontational and we need to engage in constructive dialogue around shared agendas. But these agendas, and I think that we're going to talk about this later on, depend on like who sets the table, who allows whom to talk, to sit, and to do what. We need a new governance in the sense that it's very clear that we saw it at WTO with discussions on the waiver. We have seen it at WHO every time we try to talk about IP and public health, that there is like a need to reformulate like all structures in a way that will allow for all actors to really express themselves and really convey their interests. And finally, the outcomes. I think that in the report that, that, that we are that we are talking about today, there's something that I find it very interesting because it's really basic, but but it makes makes a, a change in the sense like the outcome. No, it depends on the product. So in a sense, it's different that we are trying to license like a diagnostic kit that if we are trying to license like something really much more complex as a vaccine. So in the sense, maybe like one approach would be to be product-based in the sense, let's start with something that, okay, who is like the public research institution that can develop this diagnostic or this uh, vaccine that can be used like without having to really engage in like deep cold uh, supply chain, etc. And I think that at the end, and, and that's very clear with this report, it's that the issue of licensing will remain like a key in global health. I mean, and, and here, I think it's very important that, that we look the experience of universities allied for essential medicines, what's doing the medicines patent pool, what's been discussing in countries like the Netherlands, we might come back to this on socially sustainable licensing guidelines. I mean, there's a lot going on and there's much more coming, but we really need to keep on focus in the sense that licensing, like non-exclusive licensing is just one pillar of many others that build up like policies for like equitable access. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Jaume. Uh, we'll head over to um, Adrian, who will speak about alternate uh, business models. He will reflect uh, on his research and how it connects to this uh, report. Thanks, Adrian. Thank you. Thank you so much, Priti. I'll be as fast as as, um, as possible. Um, let's see if we can get to the discussion soon, which is the interesting part. Um, I'll... I actually been picking out some of the slides that I prepared because many of the things have been already said. Uh, just a few notes on um, some key issues that we need to consider when we talk about licensing is that there's been a major change in how pharmaceutical R&D is performed. And we used to think on pharma R&D as uh, organizations that would take uh, forward all the research process from research, early stage research to marketing and sales. And what we see now, it's a much more complex picture. Um, and we see many different organizations playing many different roles across the entire R&D chain. So we see universities uh, doing a lot of uh, research and scouting and licensing agreements, uh, moving forward to development trial with contract research organizations, um, CMOs, uh, formulators, et cetera, in production. So we can say that the, the picture has become much more complex than a few decades ago. Um, and this is important because um, when we talk about licensing and the role of universities and public research centers, 
um, we can probably say that we have more leverage now to include socially oriented licensing conditions, or we can say that we have more leverage to negotiate for, for the public interest. Um, this change in the number of actors and the complexity of the chain also means that uh, the development process has become a relay race, where with each step of the of the chain, from basic research to preclinical to phase one, phase two, etc., we have a baton being changed, which is basically the knowledge uh, that is changed uh, from one owner to the other, and in return we have uh, um, money being uh, moved from one player to the other. Um, this has uh, cause uh, many issues regarding affordability of products downstream, but it also means that early stage upstream uh, actors have more leverage to include conditions that impact uh, downstream uh, access um, to, to medicines, vaccines and, and therapies. Um, I really wanted to highlight uh, a few points on why this report is important to me. I think this notion of complexity is really well reflected in the report. Um, I think that the notion of uh, complexity is actually a bit tricky because it can give the impression that um, that it's uh, paralyzing in the sense that there are many different factors that influence licensing and therefore everything is already determined. So why bother? Um, where uh, I actually think that it's the opposite. It gives public uh, uh, public policies more space and more leverage points to 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 um, uh, focus on advocacy and policy making that have uh, broader influence than just focusing in one single aspect. Um, I think it also leads to the point of, of more strategic public policies that can have more uh, knock-on effects uh, downstream. Um, if we understand the, the different determinants, we can focus in strengthening uh, public institutions. And Jaime and Irene have been very clear in uh, you know that the fact that uh, the, the technology transfer offices don't have a lot of um, or have a lot of HR problems, or there's some kind of uh, institutional um, barriers that 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 force the forces them to 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 operate in a certain way, and that's you know that's a, a, an entry point for public policies to to reshape the system. Um, basically, what what we or one of the takeaways that I get, that I get from the report is that. Um, by analyzing the determinants, you basically subtract the, um, I would call, agency of the of the universities and so on, um, and, and you have a broader system-wide, um, um, let's say, landscape, right, where uh, you can tailor and, and, and create a more enabling environment to, to treat knowledge as a global public good by including all the different determinants that the report uh, lays out very clearly. And um, I think this is also, I, I just made this last point uh, just to agree with Jaume um, in the sense that we really need to, and this is something that it's very clearly reflected in the report, that we sometimes uh, like to stick in our communities in global health and access to medicines. And this report makes it very clear that we need to talk to many other constituencies, uh, talk to universities, talk to technology transfer offices, and so on and so forth, in order to make sure that we have a mission-oriented system. Um, if we keep talking about among ourselves, uh, we're going to keep probably repeating the same, the same results. Um, and that's everything that I that I wanted to say. I hope it was uh, fast enough. Um, and a last point, I really wanted to thank uh, Salud por Derecho and Health Action International um, for for this amazing piece of research. I think uh, sometimes uh, people are not aware of the of the power and and the importance of civil society organizations. Uh, creating knowledge and evidence-based uh, policies in the system. So um, congratulations, uh, Brent, and, and thank you so much. Thanks so much. That was really uh, quick and uh, insightful. Um, <laughs> we go over to Maza, uh, who will uh, tell us uh, what kind of openings um, uh, CSOs can potentially exploit as far as uh, tech transfer discussions are concerned in the context of the pandemic accord. Great. Thank you so much, Priti. I hope everyone can, can hear me. Um, firstly, as, as Adrian had said, I really would like to thank um, Salud por Derecho and Health Action International for this great report and also for including the People's Vaccine Alliance in this important discussion. It's been really interesting to hear from, from everyone, uh, Irene and Jaime, others about the how exclusive licensing of technology hinders equitable access 
to it and how it can be addressed. And you know, at the People's Vaccine Alliance, we believe that the ongoing negotiations on this new pandemic instrument offer really a key opportunity to address these challenges and create a global structure for R&D and access to medical products, which includes effective mechanisms for tech transfer. Of course, right as I start speaking, there's a very loud noise behind me. So I hope that everyone can, can hear me despite, despite that. Um, you know, so what we've seen is that who controls the technology and where production takes place has a direct impact on who has access to the final product. And the consequences of this norm, I say in quotes, or business as usual, as, as you said, Irene, um, is, you know, was really laid bare by the pandemic. You know, COVID-19 vaccine distribution was mostly focused in the regions where these particular vaccines were being produced. And as a result, you know, regions without the vaccine manufacturing capacity were left dependent on other regions to meet the demands and often belatedly. And Irene and Jaime, you said early on in the report, I was really flagging when you said, you know, that the um, when you were setting the context that the consequences of this way of doing things represented a moral breaking point. And I could really not, you know, agree more. It's no coincidence that the distribution of the morbidity and the mortality patterns followed what you called, you know, the pattern of exclusion that we saw with the access to, to these um, essential tools. You know, as Irene has mentioned, it's also critical to point out that this matters beyond COVID concentration leads to supply shortages. And we've seen that um, again in the response to recent emergencies like monkeypox and cholera. So instead of competing, you know, for these limited supplies, countries should collaborate to maximize them by sharing technology and waiving the relevant IP rights. So we think that the treatment, I mean, the treaty should mandate governments to promote collaborative innovation between scientists in the North and the South through funding conditions and other policies. And the treaty could commit governments to mandate tech transfer and IP sharing of relevant technology that they co-fund co with capable producers internationally to prevent and respond to pathogens of, of pandemic potential. And as we know, despite what the big Western pharmaceutical companies repeatedly tell us, you know, those capable producers do exist in, in many countries. The draft of the, the treaty that we saw last week does indeed propose that WHO members include a mechanism for transfer of tech and know-how in the final agreement to ensure rapid and, and equitable access. And you know, importantly, building research and development and capacity for development and absorption of tech in low and middle income countries is not only beneficial to those countries, I think that's sometimes something that we forget, it's beneficial to all countries to accelerate and improve R&D and to maximize the supply of, of medical technologies. Um, the new pandemic instrument should also encourage research and collaboration and financing of the WHO mRNA hubs and spokes that Jaume mentioned um, which we are very excited about at the People's Vaccine Alliance and other regional initiatives based on shared technology. Investment in such different R&D models should be prioritized by multilateral initiatives that fund health technology, um, such, such as CEPI, as has been mentioned. Um, lastly, you know, as has already been talked about today, governments should attach conditionalities to public funding for R&D, for tech transfer and sharing IP rights through, for example, the medicines patent pool um, or mechanisms like CTAP and the treaty can and should mandate um, WHO members to do so. So I'll leave it at that for now, Priti, because I know that we're, we're running out of time. Thank you. Thanks so much for that. Um, and, and, I, and I guess this community of listeners uh, are already aware it's Article 7 of the Conceptual Zero Draft that talks about um, or potential obligations on, on tech transfer, but we don't know how that will shape up by, by February 2023. Um, we don't have a whole lot of time for questions, but you know, I, I have a few questions. Maybe we, we go over to Irene first. Um, you know, uh, in your presentation, you, uh, you did uh, articulate the limitations um, on um, public funded research organizations offering non-exclusive licensing. Yes, there are limitations, but it also seems as if that there, you know, there's a spectrum and various degrees of exclusivities. Um, so, what what do you think are some of the low hanging fruits in terms of uh, making making um, technology more accessible, given the kinds of licensing arrangements that exist already, Irene? Gracias, Priti. 
Pues, um, a ver, yo creo que... Um, creo que Thank hay... you, Preeti. I think there is a lot of room for maneuver, indeed. And uh, it is assumed as such by everybody, I'd say. There's not only licensing modalities, uh, but right now it is perceived that semi-exclusive licenses could provide a, a lot of room to include uh, issues related to IP, price production, distribution into the picture. And those are elements that are there. And it is well perceived and very clearly perceived. For instance, a CTAP and initiatives such as this can be rolled out and applied to other illnesses. And uh, uh, I believe there are many elements on the basis of which we can start building a licensing model that is far more equitable and fair when it comes to the production of technologies. Having said that, we need to start identifying those stakeholders, their research centers, the technology transfer offices. We need to start talking to them, building bridges, trying to generate that dialogue. That's very important. Uh, thanks for that. Uh, I had a question for Adrian as well. Um, you know, if you could just sort of also link to, to your research and suggest what are uh, the alternate models, as it were, um, wh why is it so difficult, for instance, what, what are the kinds of market dynamics that shape licensing decisions? That's a five-year uh, answer, um, five-year research project to answer that, uh, hopefully. Um, I, I, I'm going to refer back to the report, actually, nice. and I think some of the, the barriers or the determinants that they identified were basically very useful to, to understand why alternative uh, ways of doing R&D are difficult to sustain or, or to propose. And it's because we have a system that is basically oriented to behave in a certain way. And unless you create the incentives and, and you train uh, people to operate in a different way, it's very difficult that, you know, organizations just um, emerge out of the blue. Of course, we have well-known examples um, and we have DNDI um, as a very good example. We have some public uh, public or state owned the uh, uh, R&D um, institutions that have been able to to carry out research and development and develop very um, impactful um, uh, tools such uh, as in Cuba uh, but on, but uh, also in, in other countries um, I think obviously when we talk about public uh, financing and, and philanthropic financing we we talk about how to condition this finance to obtain uh, downstream uh, downstream effects, uh, but we also need to understand all other determinants such as um, regulatory and uh, manufacturing, um, but but more organizational ones like uh, what are the the norms that uh, that operate within a certain organization that makes it render the results that it that it, it has. No, um, so not an easy answer. Um, I, I would like to use an example of, of what an alternative business model would be, and it's uh, the, the example of AMR, for instance, uh, where we might be seeing smaller organizations, mostly small and medium enterprises, trying to come up with different uh, with, uh, with new antibiotics, but with not sufficient pull mechanisms that, that makes them survive. We have push mechanisms, push funding with certain access principles that might be useful to have downstream effects, but without downstream policies uh, and support from the public sector and philanthropic sector, it's going to be very difficult to, to sustain that in the future. So you, you can have the principles in place at the very beginning of the of the chain of development, but if you don't develop something at the end, um, it's going to be tricky to sustain this in the long term, if, if that makes sense. Thank you so much. Um, I, I just had one last question, and it's to all our panelists. I don't know, or maybe one of you would like, like to take a stab uh, stab at it. Um, you know, the, the report um, sort of calls for, uh, you know, equitable access provisions to be drafted. Uh, but could you sort of uh, share uh, from your uh, collective expertise 
uh, how such a provision can can look like. Let let's say hypothetically in a in in the pandemic accord. Uh, Jaume, you you spoke about the mRNA hub, uh, but it's things are not still straightforward about how how the hub will actually be able to uh, share and license and so on. Uh, but so how how do you think some of these provisions could look like? Uh, Maza or Jaume? Yes, I will just read like the question that Michelle Childs from the NDI just shared in the chat in the sense that the zero draft from the intergovernmental negotiating body for the pandemic accord, there's like an article eight that really seeks to really get like specific wording on like guidelines and norms, including conditions on public financing of r &D. So it's clear clearly like one of the ways that we can advance the issue is there. We, can, we have also good discussion going on uh, at the European level with HERA. How can we make HERA like closer to ensuring public return? But I think it's really, and with the tech transfer hub as well, it's really everywhere all the time. Maza, do you want to come in on this? Just to say that, yes, those conditions are, are really essential, yes, yeah, especially given what we've seen in the case of a situation like Moderna, where they received, you know, the 10 billion in, in public funding and then ended up charging with 66% of, you know, net profit margins. So those, those um, conditions are essential and we really hope that we see those. Thanks, Preeti. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, we are almost uh, at, at the end of the hour. So um, I will uh, hand over to Jean May uh, and maybe there is potentially some participation from the audience. Thanks so much. Yeah, the issue is like we are at the, at the end of the time that we had like foreseen for, for this webinar, but the fact that we have run out of time it really shows like that there is like interest for the topic and there is also a lot of things to say and discuss. I wouldn't want to finish this without thanking again the authors of the report, Irene and Jaime, that was a really hard assignment and they delivered with success. But also I really want to ask like the 38 people that have stuck with us toward to the end really like to keep on like looking at this space our organizations the participants in this event we will keep on working on the on how to get like this equitable access how to really improve licensing systems procedures and actors and really that it might not seem like this but things are getting better i mean we are really turning the the page on plenty of discussions regarding access to health technology. It's not time to give up. Thank you. And thank you, Priti. Thank you all. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thanks for joining. Thank you very much. Bye.